This video is going to contain spoilers from the off, so I'm warning you now before going any further. Wow. Just wow. What an episode of Shogun that was. Episode 9 of the show has just been released, and I think it's safe to say that it's most definitely the most important episode that there's been so far, especially when it comes to determining the fate of the future of Japan. With Mariko sacrificing herself at the end and getting purpose out of her death, being free of the disgrace that had burdened her for her entire life, and Yabushige's traitorous actions that we saw glimpses of throughout the nine episodes reaching its peak in this climactic penultimate episode, episode nine was everything that the show had been building towards. So let's not wait any longer and let's jump into the episode and break down all that there was to take away from it. Here is Shogun episode nine, ending explained. The flashback during the beginning. This episode started out with the section of the flashback in Mariko's life following her father's death that we'd never really seen delved into before. This was based 14 years ago and showed Mariko in the Shonai region looking like she'd run away from Todabuntaro, who we heard spared her from death, yet she wanted to find it. The very thing that we saw she was still doing in the present day. She saw her life as an abyss to quote the title to episode 8 and she saw no purpose in it. This opening section was very important for a number of different reasons. The first is because it was when she first met Father Martin Alvito and was introduced to Catholicism, the religion that she practiced and lived her life by for the following 14 years, and it was also where she got her name, Maria. This is the name of the real historical figure that Lady Mariko Toda was based on, Akechi Tama also known as Tamako, and she was baptized as Maria when she found Christianity. So I thought it was a nice touch that they decided to include it in the show. The second reason that this was important was because it connected to the ending really well. It was said how she was seeking death, and right at the end, that was the very thing that she sought after on multiple different occasions. However, the nature of her death took on a completely different meaning to what it would have done at the start. Maricor said how life and death both had value in them and they both had purpose, and during the beginning her death would have had no purpose whatsoever, running away and dying alone. Whereas at the end, seeing her standing in front of the door, protecting those in front of her and being willing to die for a cause, a cause that her father was fighting against many years ago, she died with the purpose that she always wanted to, she'd finally escaped the life that she no longer wanted and her death meant something. Maricor's death and its importance Mariko's death was definitely the moment that stole this episode. She was faced with a potential death sentence on three occasions throughout the one hour runtime. The first was when she tried to walk out of Osaka Castle and was almost slain where she stood. The second was when she was going to commit seppuku, and the third time was when it actually happened, which was when she was met with the explosion of the doors being blasted open. Mariko's death came about due to Ishido and Yabushige working together. Ishido was stuck between a rock and a hard place in knowing that if Mariko committed seppuku, then there'd be a revolt from the high families in Osaka. But if he let her go back to Torunaga, then all of the other hostages would want to leave too. So in his best interest, he gave her papers which allowed her to leave. However, it wasn't worth the paper that it was written on, and it was never going to be the case at all. He wanted to make it seem like she could leave, but then during the dead of night, have her taken hostage, but make out to the others that she left. He also got Yabushige involved in this by promising that he wouldn't meet death if he was the person that let the shinobi in. This is something that will most likely come back to get Yabushige if Toronaga finds out his involvement in the plan. I always thought Yabushige's actions were relatively harmless and almost comical, but this one showed him to be the snake and coward that he was and it made me dislike the character. The lack of willingness to help Blackthorn protect the door was something that showed how weak of a person he was and that he wasn't prepared to put himself in harm's way for the sake of the very people that he endangered and betrayed. Mariko didn't welcome the death at first, and we saw her fighting back. This entire scene was so well orchestrated, and I absolutely loved it. When the shinobi broke into the room and Blackthorn whipped out his pistol and just fired at them, I thought it was just epic. They didn't expect it, and the strength from distance was something that did prove to be advantageous. However, with them needing to flee into a room that had stronger doors, they were trapped, and the shinobi set off some explosives outside of the door, which ultimately led to Mariko standing in front of it and being killed when it went off. The final line that Mariko said was, Ayakechi Mariko, protest this shameful act from Lord Ishidor, and by my death, but then she was cut off and she didn't get to finish her sentence. But I imagine she was going to go on to elaborate on what her death meant. However, I feel we can kind of work this out. 
What I thought was interesting about her final words was that she referred to herself as a Kechi Mariko, her father's name, rather than Mariko Toda, which is Bentaro's name and how everybody usually referred to her. This showed that she was dying on behalf of her father and knowing the weight that her death would carry, especially with it seeming like it came at the hands of Ishido and his actions, rather than her committing seppuku. This was her feeling like she was completing the plan that her father laid in place all of those years ago before she died and why it was that he made sure that she was married before he died. This also connected to the line that Mariko said to Lady Ochiba no Kata when she asked if Ochiba wasn't tired of all of this. Mariko said, death isn't surrender, flowers are only flowers when they fall. This showed the mindset that Mariko had in her final moments and she saw the beauty in dying for a cause that she believed in and knowing that it would contribute to the change in the tide of the tension that was present between Ishido and Toranaga. She wasn't this leafless branch that was settled in the snow, she was the flower that had fallen. Mariko's death will most likely cause the revolt that was mentioned in the earlier part of the episode when the council were meeting and discussing what options to take. This will most likely cause Lord Ishido to lose support and be forced to release the hostages that he wanted to keep contained within Osaka. So both of the things that he didn't want to happen will most likely occur and will ultimately weaken him. This will most likely lead to Toronaga gaining more support and most likely getting the upper hand. So what was Toronaga's plan? During the early section in the episode, we saw that Blackthorn was genuinely confused by what Mariko was doing on the boat with him and Yabushige. We even saw that when she was taking on Ishidor's men, he was staring bemusedly, questioning what her intentions were or what her greater plan was. It very much seemed like Toranaga's plan was for her to get out of Ishidor that people that were inside of Osaka were essentially being held as hostage. If she returned, then Toranaga would know how to act, and if she didn't return, then she'd be able to commit seppuku, as it would mean that she wouldn't be able to carry out her lord's wishes, thus allowing her to step out of the life that she never wanted to carry on following her father's betrayal. He knew that her death would cause ripples throughout Osaka if it did ultimately come to that, so it was almost like a two birds one stone thing, him being kind to Mariko and allowing her to rid herself of the burden, but also him being able to gain the upper hand with the ripples that would go through Japan. Will he have expected what happened? Personally, I don't think Toranaga would have expected Shinobi to be called upon and be the very reason that Mariko ended up dying. Not even the master of trickery could have predicted that. But he may have thought that Ishido would have done his best to have kept her there, so his response is something that I'm really interested in seeing in the final episode. He's lost his son, Nagakado, his most loyal friend, Hiromatsu, and now, Mariko, somebody who he treated like a daughter following a Kechi Jinsai's death. So Toronage is quite literally sacrificing all of the people closest to him in order to win this. A small but important detail. There was one small detail in this episode that was like a needle in a haystack, and I think this was done deliberately. This was the fact that Delacroix was aware of the fact that a war was coming. Nobody else, not even Lord Ishido, believed that Toranaga had tricks up his sleeve, as was confirmed when he said to Mariko that it seemed pointless giving her papers to leave when she'd be coming back so soon. It just showed the pure lack of intelligence that he had and the naivety that he had to the situation that was at hand. This small one-minute conversation was buried beneath the tactical play of Mariko and the epic showdown at the end, but this didn't just feel like a conversation between Delacroix and Martin Alvito. It felt like it was a message from the show towards us too. Toranaga's retaliation is going to be key and huge, and this war that Delacroix mentions is most likely the Battle of Sekigahara. I'd say the only thing that Delacroix got wrong with this was the fact that the war has actually been going on from the very moment that Toranaga stepped into the room in front of Ishido and the Council of Regents way back in episode 1. The similarity to the 80s TV series when looking at the 80s TV series, that final scene did play out relatively similarly. With Mariko being refused the possibility of leaving and going back to her Lord Toranaga, she threatened to commit seppuku. However, with Ishido knowing the damage that it could cause, he gave her permission to leave. But it was all a ruse and ninjas were hired to break in and take her during the night. Whilst it didn't look as visually stunning or feel as tense as what the final 15 minutes of this episode did, it definitely captured the emotions and overall feeling that this episode was going for. It's been 40 odd years so it can't be expected to be as visually stunning, but my god, this one was just so good. Within the 80s show and the novel as well, it does seem like Blackthorn does get injured, so I'm intrigued to see if his vision or his hearing is going to be damaged following what happened. Maricor's mindset in the episode we truly saw a different side to Mariko in this episode and it was a side that I loved to watch. There were many moments that I thought were just so emotional to bear witness to. 
There was a confidence in Mariko that we hadn't seen before when she was speaking with Ishido. A confidence that showed that she didn't respect him, nor did she care what he had to say. The turning point in this felt like it came when she mentioned how Toronaga was mourning his son Nagakado, and Ishido responded by saying, he has others, something which showed a complete lack of respect. The desperation that she had to leave, the shock that was on her face when the men were being slaughtered in front of her, and the fact that she was giving all of her energy to fight them, but knew that it was an uphill battle. Her performance paired with the score that was so perfectly composed underneath, it just added weight to the scene and you felt the pain that Mariko had inside of her. Even the confidence that she had when she was with Lady Ochiba no Kata, speaking her mind without the fear of consequence, and also thinking back to a time when they were younger and remembering how close they once were. It was an emotion-filled episode for Mariko, and you can't begin to even imagine everything that was going through her head throughout all of the chapters in this inclusion. My review of the episode. I thought this was a fantastic episode of Shogun. Like what the show has done throughout the entirety of the nine episodes that we've had, the conversation was at the heart of it, and then, beating around that heart was the occasional action scene in there to add value, not just to keep things exciting. Considering this is the longest episode that we've had of the show, I would say that it actually felt the quickest. This was Marikor's episode, and she absolutely took it and made something special with it. The show lured us into a false sense of security by making us think that Marikor would survive and leave Osaka, especially considering the fact that she faced death twice before she finally met it. And then, even on the second time, she was only a matter of seconds away from it, so it did make the ending land with real impact. I thought Yabushige's role in this episode was one that held such value as well. The lack of trust that he had in Mariko when he told her to not translate for him anymore, choosing to barely understand Blackthorn, fearing that Toranaga had a bigger plan up his sleeve, and then choosing to betray the people that he was closest with and having them killed in order to save his own skin. It showed that in a place that was so heavily focused on honor, he had none whatsoever and was prepared to do anything if it gave him the safety himself. Yabushige's arc had always been building towards a mass betrayal with devastating consequences and it definitely didn't fail to deliver. I thought Lady Ochiba no Kata and Mariko's dynamic was one that I really enjoyed seeing on screen in this episode too. I didn't quite know what to expect, whether they'd be friends, if they'd be enemies, and if there'd be any bad blood. However, you could tell that Mariko could see right through what Ochiba no Kata was doing with Ishido, and it just further cemented the fact that she cared about her son's safety. When Ochiba threw the safety of Mariko's child back at her, I thought that was such a strong moment because we hadn't seen Mariko and her son's relationship that much in the show. But he was so easily prepared to denounce his name and connection to her if she went against Ishido. So it showed that both Mariko and Ochiba, despite being raised in a similar way and having differences when they were younger, that was something that still carried through into adulthood as well. The performance of John Blackthorne is one that I have critiqued over the weeks that the show's been airing, but do you know what? I'm actually really enjoying Cosmo Jarvis's performance as the Anjin now. I've bought into the character, his conflicting feelings on which culture he now associates with, and the deep sense of care that he has for Akechi Mariko. With Father Martin Alvito's voice of prayer being the very thing that we heard over the credits, it was such a haunting way to round off the episode following Mariko's death. I didn't expect it, but with the final moments being so fast-paced and intense, the voice of prayer just sounded so sinister amongst it all. It created such an atmosphere as the credits were rolling. Honestly, I'm so gutted that the show only has one episode left. I'm genuinely intrigued to see how they're going to round it off with what I would presume is going to be about one hour of runtime left. I'm hoping that there's going to be an extended episode. I feel like we'll need it in order to see how Mariko's death is going to be handled, the potential fall of Ishido and Osaka when Toranaga arrives and what will happen with Yabushige. I had high hopes that we get the Battle of Sekigahara in this show, but I just don't think we will to be honest. That would almost need an entire episode in itself, and in a show that hasn't necessarily been battle-focused, and has only really slipped in action in the final 15 minutes of an episode, it would kind of go against everything that the show had built itself to be over the course of these nine episodes, but I've come to accept that. We don't need an all-out battle for this show to be good. It's already proved itself. Shogun is most definitely one of the best shows on TV right now, and it will probably go down as one of the best TV miniseries of all time. It's garnered great respect from viewers, and I think it thoroughly deserves it. The writing is fantastic, the pacing is just incredible, and the performances just feel so real. I'm gutted the show's coming to an end next week because I could just continue to watch it more, and it's even sadder that we know that there's not going to be a season 2. But, I guess, all good things must come to an end eventually. So, there you have it. Shogun Episode 9 Ending Explained.
If you want to see more videos on Shogun, then click on the card in the top corner. I've been covering the show since the start and will continue to do it until it concludes next week. I've also been delving into the real historical figures that the characters are based on, so if you'd like to see more on that, then head over to the channel. What did you think of this episode? Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. As always, thanks for tuning into the video and I'll see you in the next one. God, the final episode.